Hey, everybody. Welcome to another episode of the Decentralized Economy, part of the Decentralized OS web series that's sponsored by Singularity Net. My name is Bill Inman. I'm your host today, and I'm also the CEO at Singularity Studio, part of the Singularity Net family of companies. So we're super excited to have you here for this session today. It's on possibly the hottest, at least one of the hottest topics that you might be seeing in technology today, and it's NFTs. And we're gonna focus on the decentralization of art. As you'll probably hear throughout this entire session, uh, but you can use NFTs well beyond art. And I'm sure we're gonna discuss this point, those points, but we have three outstanding guests I'm going to introduce in just a second. Uh, just a little bit about NFTs. You know, As you might be seeing, if you're, if you're a follower of SingularityNet, you probably are following NFTs. And we're seeing a real paradigm shift that is affecting the art industry. And it's expected to affect many other industries, but certainly the creative industry and economy is being affected. We have the right guests today to talk about that, and we're going to really dive deep into that. Um, it's really, it's really important to understand as we get into this that NFTs are a tool for representing value for the physical things we see in our world in digital form, and that's revolutionary, especially as we move towards an AR VR world and beyond. It's going to be a phenomenal asset for those to uh, utilize and cherish and value. And we're seeing that we're going to talk about that today. So there's going to be a ton of new business models. Uh, fortunately, we have some of the early entrants who have done fairly well uh, in the space so far, this very young nascent space. So everybody, welcome to the, to the episode today. Thanks, Bill. Nice to have you. Thank you, Bill. I want to introduce you all now. I'll just start with you, Vincent. And um, I appreciate your time. You're here as I am in Los Angeles, a rainy day in Los Angeles, a very rare day, rainy day in Los Angeles. So, and uh, you're the owner at the IV Gallery. You're, you're been nicknamed NFT Moses, and I assume you'll talk a little bit about that, but you're showing us the way, I take it, to, to this, this, this new class of assets, right? That's correct, yes. That's the nickname that, uh, that someone gave me a while ago. But um, yeah, <laughs> you, you can I, explain I that in just a second. We appreciate to, to, to go through the story on that. Um, a little bit more about you. You're, you've been the mastermind behind some of the most popular drops today, right? You've just absolutely killed it with these drops uh, on Nifty Gateway with artists such as Beeple. And um, obviously, if you're following NFTs, you probably know who Beeple is now. Uh, a couple of, of us on the call today are, are deeply involved with Beeple. Uh, but you started your work as an entrepreneur, right, at a tech company. And um, you worked in many industries. You've been, you've been in multiple industries. Obviously, art is your passion. 10 years ago, you founded the IV Gallery. It, you run the gallery. You're both based in Los Angeles and New York. And uh, it's a contemporary art gallery, and you've, con both con you've cultivated a lot of rising stars there. And I'm sure you're going to go into that a little bit. Um, it was interesting to find out that among your collectors are the Winklebro Winklevoss brothers. And they brought you in specifically to bring artists and projects into the Nifty Gateway. And that's going to be exciting to hear about too. So Vincent, thank you so much for being here today. No problem. Thank you for having me. Yeah, great to have you. Um, now we have next we have Pablo Rodriguez Fraile, and thank you so much for being here today, dialing in from Miami, or hopefully it's not raining. Uh, you're a founding partner at Polybius Polybius Capital, and that's an investment fund focused on blockchain. And you're also founder at um, the uh, Museum of Crypto Art, which is one of the most successful NFT mu museums that there is today. So uh, you are a top NFT art collector. You own many of the historical and iconic NFT artworks. And for example, you bought Beeple's Crossroads, many people in the in industry, and this was really a, a seminal moment in the industry just a, a long time ago, just a few short <laughs> months ago, uh, four or five months ago, but you bought it for $67,000 in October and sold it five months later for 100X, uh, 6.6 million. And I know that that's not why you're not passionate. Your money is, is certainly great, but it's not your passion. Your passion is supporting artists. And you were one of the first and largest supporters of Beeple's career over, over this entire time. And many other prominent creators, Pac, Wisby, Andreas Reisinger, uh, Reflick Anadol, and there's many others that hopefully you can talk about today and tell us why you're supporting those artists and, and what you see in the industry. Before you started in this, of course, you, you got your degree in economics and mathematics at Columbia, as well as your MBA. Uh, obviously prepped you well for what you're doing today, but we're all learning here. So obviously you're a fast learner on top of that. And you've been investing for five years in blockchain. You've supported Algorand, Algorand Avalanche, Hedera Hashgraph, and Clayton, among others. So great background, uh, great success in the industry, as with Vincent too. And thank you so much for being here today, Pablo. Thank you very much for having me. It's a big pleasure to be with you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, we appreciate your time. And finally, Andrea Bonicetto, who is an artist, 
but also an entrepreneur. He's an NFT collector and creator. Uh, it, and this is exciting. On the 23rd of March, Nifty Gateway will will be, uh, there'll be a drop on the Nifty Gateway together with Sophia the Robot. It's the first ever human robot NFT collaboration. That's really exciting. This is obviously a Singularity Net production. So for those of you that are watching, I'm sure you're excited to hear about the NFT that features Sophia. And, uh, but before that, Andrea, you were a founder at, and still are a founder at Eterna Capital. You're focused on investing in the blockchain space there. Uh, prior to Eterna, uh, you were a founder and CEO of Hired Grad, which was a graduate recruitment startup. Uh, part of the Imperial College of London Incubator. You worked at Deloitte, KPMG. Sure, you learned a lot there. I'm sure you're really thrilled to be an entrepreneur now and kind of break free of those consulting chains. But you worked in the advisory division and were part of a business development team at Satago. So you have also been featured as a Forbes 30 under 30 in Italy, and, and that was back in 2019, but shows how progressive you are and, and continue to be. And you're really, as an artist, you're really passionate about the folk music, the poetry, the painting side, uh, obviously, the art is really something that fascinates you. And of course, you got your degree in Master's of Science from Imperial College of London, which we've already mentioned. So thank you for being here, Andrea. I really appreciate your time as well. Thanks a lot, Bill. Yeah. It, this is an all-star group, everybody. So we're going to learn a ton about NFTs today. And uh, we're really excited to bring them to you. So if I may jump in, and, and Vincent, why don't I start with you on this question? And why don't we have everybody give their, uh, their answer on this, if you don't mind? Can you please, in the simplest terms that you know how, and I'm sure you've been doing a lot of this to all of your family, friends, constituents, followers, can you explain NFT in the simplest terms for us? Sure, sure, Bill. So that's been my role as the Moses of NFTs from the start is to kind of implement this belief system. And it simply is a belief system where you understand the value of digital things. And it's nothing new. It's been around in video games for a long time. And it made sense in video games because you could buy something in a video game and use it and why it had a use it made sense that it had value but then how do we then apply value and to other things that don't necessarily have a use collectibles for example we needed to show ownership so the nft now is is, is a very simple way to show to show ownership uh, in a decentralized fashion in a transparent fashion that everyone can see uh, no one can mess with no one can copy it no one can steal it and, as long, and then imp, now we have a belief system around that people are spending money and collecting these, these, these uh, collectibles that are attached to the NFT as a form of ownership. I use the car analogy for the easiest one. Bill, if you gave me your car and you didn't give me any paperwork with it, it doesn't have any value to me because I don't own the car. If I don't have the registration document and the information isn't changed at the DMV database, uh, then I don't own the car and it has no value to me. So ownership was the key, and the NFT allows ownership of digital things. Right. Okay, great answer. So, of course, with the advent of blockchain and now it reaching the popular culture and having success in crypto, we're at the kind of the critical mass of being able to do that. Uh, at least we've, we're hyped up about it at this point. Pablo, do you have anything else to add on that? I think that was a wonderful explanation. What I would say is that uh, right now the technology allows to do something uh, that was a problem before with digital items where uh, you couldn't. Uh, it's what we call in this space, without getting too technical, the double spend problem, where you couldn't prove uh, that you wouldn't uh, transfer, sell, or otherwise engage with a digital item uh, more than once. Uh, so now blockchain technology allows to exactly verify, uh, as Vincent said, with absolutely no possibility of, 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 of mistake, uh, in, an open, in an open ledger where everybody can look at and, and, and be sure and with the assurance that uh, that asset actually uh, belongs to, to your account if you have the keys to that account. Uh, that is a new technology that is, that is, that is I guess, allowing for, for, for this to happen. So uh, it's a profound technological advance that is just catching on now, but, uh, but, but I think will we'll certainly, uh, when people understand that, that the conceptually it's, 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 it's the same as what Vincent was saying with the car, uh, just in an open, decentralized way, uh, I think I think they will realize that this is this is something that makes sense and is here to stay. Yeah, it's very exciting to see the ledger aspects in play here and the immutability um, and be able to transfer ownership around that. There's many different seminal philosophical things about blockchain that are exciting, the peer-to-peer, -peer, the decentralized, but the immutability here really plays into that. So good answer. Andrea, uh, anything, anything else to add there? Yeah, the thing I would add is uh, that's, you know, what Vincent and Pablo mentioned are two very important points because uh, many times people, you know, when they first look at the space, the first reaction is, what the hell? Like, People are buying like a JPEG or a video for like 60K millions. 
And uh, if you do that, you know, you're basically missing the point, you know, the, fo- the, the whole, like the big picture, right? As Paul was saying, like with uh, blockchain, you could basically move uh, fungible items like, you know, currencies without intermediaries. You couldn't do that with non-fungible items uh, before, you know, you're having, having NFTs and now you can. So that's the massive, you know, um, innovation that also goes beyond uh, the world of, you know, digital art, you know, it's also very important for, uh, for gaming, uh, for collectibles, for, uh, for many other areas. And I think it won't only impact the creative industry, but it will impact many other industries as well. Yeah, we look forward to hearing about those other industries on this call too. So I think that gives people a good, a good kind of simple aspect, three different perspectives on uh, NFTs and appreciate that. Andrea, we'll stick with you on this one. Can you please also explain the difference between NFTs and fungible tokens, just in brief? Yeah, so it's very simple. So something fungible is like a $1 bill, right? You have it, I have it. It's not unique, like you can uh, interchange them one for another, like they don't have unique characteristics. So money is fungible. Bitcoin is fungible, Ethereum is fungible. They work like money. Uh, non-fungible is, uh, if you think about it, the vast majority of things that we engage with. Uh, I have like two guitars behind me. These are non-fungible items, right? They're unique. Um, and uh, before you couldn't represent unique items online, you couldn't represent their identity. They didn't have a fingerprint on the web. And now they have it uh, on the blockchain. And that's, uh, you know, in a fully digital society, it's uh, something extremely important. So yeah, the main difference is that one, you know, fungible, they're all the same. Non-fungible, they're, they're unique. They have unique characteristics. Yeah, thank you for that. Uh, Man for All Seasons, true artist, music and art, multi-talented. <laughs> Vincent, anything else to add on, on that explanation of fungible versus NFT? Um, no, I think, that, I think that's great. I think Andrea got it all there. Okay, sounds good. Pablo, on your side? Uh, very, Pretty very straightforward. Good. Yeah. Thank you so much for all of you for that. Okay. So I talked to a good friend of mine recently and he was, his name's Mark Pryor and he's the CEO at the Palm Springs Art Museum. Vincent, you're here in LA. You know that Palm Springs has a very a strong art community there yeah. and he still remains on the board of the Palm Springs art community. And I said, well, what do you think about uh, NFTs? And more importantly, what do the artists in Palm Springs think there about NFT? And um, basically his answer was, well, what I'm hearing is WTF from the artist. So it's like some people are like, OMG, NFT. I got to get in this now. Let's go. But other people are like, NFT, WTF, right? They're like, what is this? So I think it's really, it'd be really great to hear from you all personally about how did you get here? <laughs> what is your journey? And, and why are you here like at the NFT space? And you're at the pinnacle of it. And I know that you're all very excited about being where you are and your goal is to remain at the pinnacle, but not just for the money because you're passionate about it. So Pablo, can you, can you tell everybody, how did you get here in this journey to NFTs? Uh, well, sure. Uh, I, I, I've been involved in the blockchain space uh, as an investor for, for, for several years now. And uh, during the first few years, I actually found uh, this project called Decentraland, uh, which is a, yeah, it's a, without getting too technical, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's what we call the metaverse. Uh, it's a, a place, a virtual world where uh, uh, people can purchase uh, digital land. Uh, I thought uh, immediately. I thought that this concept was 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 groundbreaking, and uh, and uh, consider as an easy analogy, consider if you could go into the Sims and actually build, a, you know, purchase some property there and actually own it and build whatever you wanted in those places. So I I, I obviously thought that it was a project that that, that would, would would certainly uh, you know get some response and some attention from 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 people when they when they understood what was happening here. And I, I, I placed some bets there and, 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 and watched the develop for some time. Now, uh, about uh, a year and a half ago, I, I, I was approached as well uh, with, with some, some people around in the space and they, they, they pointed me to, to what was happening and the innovation that was occurring in the space. So I started to take another look and I, I realized that, that again, that the amount of projects, the amount of people innovating and what was happening here was truly extraordinary. So I uh, quickly, uh, and uh, what we call the you know, controlled aggression, uh, I started to uh, try to, to purchase some digital land and it quickly became one of the largest uh, uh, landowners of, of the space. And we realized that this was, you know, an immense place full of possibilities, uh, you know, the digital, like we're moving to the digital world. So 
In parallel, we also realized what was happening with the, the digital art space and you know, extrapolating the technology the same ways of, of, of why NFTs work. We realized that it was just a better way uh, to, uh, to, to show the provenance, to transact, to show the history, to engage with this with the digital work so it was a very very clear decision very very easy uh for me to to understand that uh, that it was this was just giving the opportunity to many of these artists and creators through the technology uh to do something they were not being able to do before because of the double spend problem but that their their, their importance in the in art history is 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 as profound or even more uh, than the contemporary traditional artists that we know of today, in my opinion. Uh, so we started, uh, you know, uh, engaging with all the main creators and, and with all the people in the industry and started pushing forward, uh, you know, artistic immersive experiences uh, in virtual reality, for example, and um, and uh, and just supporting the artist's careers and, and somewhat validating along the way that this was an important uh, revolution that was taking place and that uh, and that it was certainly here to stay. Yeah, great answer. Very fascinating. And of course, you had the benefit of being in the blockchain space and, and obviously you have a digital mind as well. At least it's focused on it. So you understand, you can recognize the opportunity. But I think a, a lot of the viewers here will get a lot out of what you just said about how your journey kind of evolved to get there. Vincent, can I pass that question to you? How did you get to, to this point with NFTs? Yes, no problem. I just want to say you got Pablo, he kind of undersells himself a bit, but he is very much a like the earliest adopter and kind of front runner and market maker in a lot of these spaces if it wasn't for him on on nifty kind of uh, taking a position with with mike and people to start with and some of the other, these other big artists we probably wouldn't be seeing the movement we're seeing now so this pablo is the key to this uh, to this nft boom at the moment so he, he does undersell himself a bit but he's he's the guy to watch anyway um i got a call from tyler winklevoss last year and uh, he and he actually both of them bought their first works of art from me ever started their collection a few years ago. Um, and he said, we just bought this new platform called Nifty Gateway. Do you know what NFTs are? Uh, I said, I don't. And then by the end of the call, I did know what NFT was. But what was interesting about this new platform, um, it was it made complete sense to me because you could use fiat to buy these NFTs and you could check out like you're on Amazon or eBay. It's very, very simple. Um, after doing a bit of research after that call, I know a few people that tried to get it, it were interested in what was happening on other platforms, but because they weren't crypto people, they couldn't understand how to buy the, these things. So after the call with, with, with Tyler about Nifty Gateway and then a, a few more calls and then uh, helping with its launch, I saw a, a direction where I could bring in artists, bring in projects from outside of the crypto world, especially from the fine art world, and also bring in collectors based around purely now that you can own digital things, digital art, digital collectibles. And I didn't even mention crypto. Crypto wasn't, wasn't, it wasn't in the equation. It was, didn't matter whether you had crypto or not. Um, simply using the NFT as a tool for you to understand how to value a digital thing, how to own it, and, and how to buy and sell it. But what was very interesting to me about this, why I wanted to pursue it, is in my world, in the contemporary art world, the value is, is, is on the concept, is on the idea among, among, above everything else, above mechanical talent, um, above, uh, above aesthetics. I mean, there's plenty of important works of art in museums that I visit that are elephant poop or piles of candy and that's not a joke that that's a real thing so it it, it made sense to me that if you're gonna if you're gonna pursue this kind of uh, the value in the idea and the concept then digital is where we need to be there's no li limit to what artists can do with their imagination but up to this point there hasn't been a, a, a way to commercialize it there is video art there is new media art in museums but from a commercial perspective it doesn't get the big money uh, in the marketplace compared to painting. Muted myself by accident, sorry. So it was very interesting to me to then to pursue this direction of, of kind of making, of bringing digital art more to the forefront. Now we know how to value it. So that was the mission. I went out and brought in artists uh, uh, from, from different sort of sectors, trying different things, brought in collectors. And, built, and I saw very quickly that it worked. There was, I could easily get people to come into this new belief system, see the value in this digital work and start a whole, a whole new kind of way of collecting. I'll tell you what was most interesting 
Um, and this sounds strange to people. So again, in my, in my art world, the contemporary art world, the fine art world, my collectors don't buy art because they have a space on the wall that they want to fill. They buy art because I want that piece. I love that artist. I want to support that artist. Uh, shit, where am I going to put it? That, that, that's the, that, that's, that's the, the uh, it, it's always that, that kind of uh, method. Um, and I've got plenty of collectors with crates full of artwork, storage route, um, warehouses full of artwork. Uh, Beth De Woody is, is one who supports the arts greatly. She has 10,000 works and she will just keep collecting and keep collecting. Now in this digital space, I, I bring on these same collectors. Now there's no off switch. They can keep collecting from the artists they love and they don't run out of storage. They don't have to think where we're going to put it. They're going to, they just have to keep collecting it. So this is what I want to try and make, uh, like really show in this, with this kind of hype cycle we're in at the moment, that this is here to stay. I've brought a lot of collectors on that just simply want to collect the work. It's not about, it's, it's not a, it's not about the trading, it's not about the speculation, it's about wanting to collect work from particular artists. So it's the same relationship with the collectors and the artwork as we have in the physical world, but now they have no off switch uh, when it comes to the, the digital space. So that's, as me, as an art dealer, that's very exciting. Yeah, that is exciting. Right place, right time for you. And I'm gonna have a few questions for all of you. It's very fascinating, first of all, by the way. Love to hear these, these origin stories because they, they're gonna help a lot of people understand the market and understand that they can do it. And that's, that's gonna be a follow-up question for you here, Vincent, in a second. But let me, let me elaborate on what you just said. How tech, you're, you started a tech company, right? So you're a fairly technical guy. Did you know blockchain well before you got that call from the Winklevoss a year ago? Was it Tyler Winklevoss, I think you said? Yeah, Tyler called me, uh, rudimentary understanding. My brother had a big mining operation in Europe uh, early uh, in the early days for Bitcoin. So I had a rudimentary understanding. Um, I do have a financial background. My uncle was a pretty big regulator um, in, the, in the UK, uh, London Stock Exchange and run the Hong Kong Stock Exchange for a while. So have a finance understanding, have a, a rudimentary blockchain understanding. Um, and, and so, yet, but not enough, I mean, not enough for me to jump in until it, instead that the turning point was the fact that there was a platform now that we could use fiat um, with and check out, buy with your credit right. cards, check out like Amazon and eBay. So that was the most exciting thing to me was, uh, was, was being able to get people's head around buying and owning digital things. Yeah, um, and that's, that is one of the exciting things here. We're not just talking about crypto, right? We're talking yeah. about the immutability of the blockchain. I mean, that's the real way, and that's the real wave that's yeah. happening now. That's why we, ha and that's why we have a lot of mainstream press. Uh, we, I mean, the the first we, we did the drop with Beeple um, when Pablo bought the first two pieces of auction. That was great, but then the second drop we did for Beeple did three and a half million dollars on the platform on Nifty Gateway, which was unbelievable. Blew everything out the water and didn't get any really reaction outside of kind of the, 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 the coin telegraph and crypto publications. So the world still didn't know about it until it was on the platform, like obviously Christie's was, was made all the difference. And then we had a few people in the last few weeks kind of uh, it, 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 who were very influential um, talking about their position on, on NFTs. But it, it wasn't, it, yeah, even with the amount of money that was, that was floating around in the last few months, it needed to have that kind of boost within the mainstream press and mainstream kind of people even outside of crypto, which is happening now. We're, yeah, we're there for sure now. Thank you for that answer and the elaboration. Andrea, I'm gonna to pass to you. Uh, love to know how, as an artist, right? And also you've been involved with private equity. How did you get to this point with NFTs that you are today? Yeah, it's, um, it's a long story, let's say. I started, uh, as you say, I mean, as an investor, you know, I've been investing, you know, like Pablo in the blockchain space for a few years. And uh, so, I mean, I've been involved, you know, in knowing all the different, you know, key people in the space. And actually in 2019, I happened to be on a, speaking at a conference on a like enormous cruise. Uh, it was a nice format for a conference. If you think about that on a cruise, uh, starting from Barcelona and uh, then, you know, doing stops like in France and other places and then until uh, uh, Rome. And in that conference, uh, there were speakers like, uh, you know, the co-founder of Wikipedia, Brock Pierce, uh, the Stani from uh, Ave and others. And I remember that when we finished the conference, then, uh, you know, we left basically in Civita Vecchio, it's close to Rome. And then we said, okay, we have the plane uh, uh, late at night, uh, like, let's go eat something like for lunch all together in Rome. So we went with some of the speakers in Rome and uh, I had the chance to speak a bit more with uh, Brock Pierce that 
I understood we shared like similar interests around uh, some weird stuff like uh, uh, Indian uh, philosophy, uh, esotericism, like rare books and stuff. And um, and basically, um, we he then asked me if I knew of any like rare bookstores in Rome, which I didn't know. But then you know we went. Uh, I went. To, you know for. I checked like briefly and then I found one. We went together there. And when we entered, I remember the owner of the place said to him, this, he said, I think like you look, you are an artist. I need to give you something. Then he goes, he takes a book and he gives to him uh, a book of Kandinsky called uh, Concerning the Spiritual in Art. Okay. And then I like to live, you know, life in a very fluid way and take signs, you know, when I see them. So I'm like, okay, I want to read that book. And then when I read it, uh, when I came back to London, uh, I really empathized a lot with the book. I felt that it was really covering many things that I also believed around, you know, the art world, the connection with spirituality, the fact that uh, the artist is actually subject to the period he lives in and not, you know, vice versa. And from that onwards, you know, I was already like uh, drawing and playing music uh, um, even before that, but I started drawing like in a very like compulsive way. And also Kandinsky was someone that started drawing at 30 years old. And at the time I was myself 30 years old. And uh, then, you know, that was the time where uh, the NFT trend, you know, was also picking up. And I was like, okay, interesting. Like then at some point, you know, I can definitely start, um, uh, you know, even you know, selling my art as, as NFTs. And then I started as well collecting uh, um, NFTs, of course, not to the extent of uh, Pablo, but, uh, I was, uh, you know, I took some early bets as well. And then really from there, um, I've been always, you know, very open and I met uh, many, you know, interesting people and uh, it, it was very organic. And uh, that's how I like to do things. And uh, for me, it was really a process of being uh, more and more myself through time. I don't like situations where people are identified with the job they have. I think that uh, if you also see Generation Z, what they really care about more, they're called the true generation. They really want to be authentic. They care a lot about creativity. So I think that uh, we should move towards a society where uh, this is extremely important. Expressing yourself for who you are is important. I think, I'm hoping that NFTs uh, will be the catalyst for that. Yeah, I think that one thing with all three of you is that um, there's a great financial opportunity now for all of us, as we know, and the three of you are taking hold and doing that. But it really, I can feel your passion about the artistry here and, and being sharing this with the world, this revolution. So that's really exciting. It's nice. And I think the users are going to appreciate that. It's not just about the money, everybody. It's about changing the art world and passion and, and so forth. And, and so I'm going to come back to you, Pablo. You have supported many artists, including people, for a long time. When did you start that and why did you do that? And, and what drove you to do that? Well, I, I, I had the opportunity or, or I guess the luck to, to be able to be surrounded by just general art and architecture uh, all my life. I'm also have a, a, beautiful, uh, a beautiful wife that is a designer and architecture herself. So uh, this is something that is always very present uh, in my life. But uh, you know, when I was going through this journey and I started with uh, my good, a good friend from a long time, uh, uh, from, from a very long time ago with Colburn Bell, uh, we really realized that uh, that there was, uh, you know, that that it was the right time to to allow creators uh, 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 to, to 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 really express and to really, uh, you know, start monetizing their creations, the digital creations. So that happened about a year and a half ago, a little bit less maybe, when we really started, uh, you know, engaging with all with all the creators, with all the participants in the space, and uh, I guess uh, you know, supporting uh, those that we thought that were. Uh, you know that were that, that were that were doing things again for 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 like that, 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 let's call it the more the more thoughtful uh, uh, the more thoughtful creators uh, the ones that that stood out uh, over time because uh, you know they they, they, they they think about how their career uh, can evolve through this technology and uh, you know we've it's, it's been fascinating because we've met you know uh, an incredible amount of fascinating uh, uh, creators over this period. And we've worked and collaborated together to put these artistic immersive experiences again in virtual reality uh, that are are, are very uh, easy to connect with to people. And I've I've brought I brought in people from all like sorts of places and and ages and and everybody's just blown away because they instantly connect, they instantly understand what is happening here. And and, and NFTs 
uh, immediately makes sense. And I think that we're witnessing a you know a cultural revolution. And for me, as you said, it's it's it's. I mean, the, the, everybody likes uh, uh, the money. Everybody likes uh, more wealth, of course. But the reality is that uh, for 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 many of us. Uh, I believe that uh, it's 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 a lot more important to just be part of the historical uh, revolution that is happening, and 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 just uh, you know to be uh, I'm just thankful to be around the the wonderful uh, innovation that is happening in the space by by everybody, the community. It's just it's just extraordinary. I've never seen anything like this. It's it's extraordinary. You're a good representative of the community, as Vincent said earlier. I think you're an extremely humble guy, and you are you're a, it looks like you're a keystone figure in this. So please keep up the good work, uh, Vincent. Uh, just dovetailing on what you said. Uh, a few moments ago, as an art dealer, can other art dealers do what you do, or does it take a specific skill? And and by the way, would you want them to? I guess that's kind of a that's kind of a personal side of it. But can can other art dealers, art collectors, do what you do? Bring other artists into the fold here, educate them, put them on the platform. What do you think? Certainly not. No, it's just me. No, no, I'm kidding. <laughs> now, the beauty of this of this space in this direction, it, it's a whole new world that we need everyone to take part in. So every art dealer, if, if, a, if an art dealer has a retail space, then they can have, and then they can also have a digital retail space as well uh, and, and have an NFT and have a digital art program. Um, so it's open to all, there will be ecosystems in place just as there are in, in the retail world, in the gallery world, in, in any industry that this goes into, there will be a kind of the digital duplicate, which is an addition, not necessarily replacing. It's, this is, as it, it's disruptive in some components, but most of, the, most of this is just disruption is an addition to an existing industry. It's not replacing anything. So with, with art, we're not going to replace physical art, but we're going to have an addition there where artists can, well, I, I can choose to paint, I can choose to make sculpture, I can choose to create digital. It's a new medium. Um, so it's, it's open to the world. Every, it's, it, we, we need to build a whole ecosystem. Right, absolutely. It's for it to be successful and, and um, a rising tide raises all boats, right? So I totally agree with that. And you know these emerging tech people often get confused. Oh, is it going to replace a job? Is it is it going to is it going to replace how I live today? We're seeing that on the um, humanoid nurse robot side, right? No, we're not trying to replace all nurses. This is a supplement to the healthcare side. So same thing here. It's an addition to the physical world. However, the digital world is becoming more and more impactful. Um, so Andrea, back to you. So your journey has led you to this drop that's going to happen later this month, right? And uh, obviously this is the Singularity Net production has a lot of people excited about. Sophia, can you go into what's happening with that? Yeah, definitely. I mean, it's uh, very exciting and I'm very glad to collaborate with, uh, you know, the genius of David Hanson, the team at, you know, Singularity, Ben, Marcello as well, who, you know, made this, you know, possible. Um, and basically, um, what is it in a nutshell, you know, is a step towards the direction of basically saying, uh, okay, AI is definitely revolutionary and is already widely used, you know, on many operational tasks, but the ultimate stage, the ultimate development of AI is actually whether AI can be creative, can produce art. And so many people would argue AI cannot create art because it does not have the metaphysical element of human being, the concept of death not afraid of death, which is uh, a very strong, like creative element for me, at least. But then the second stage is, uh, but then what if we basically work together and as humans and uh, AIs, you know, we deliver something together, which is completely new, right? And I think, you know, that's what we're trying to do now, like is a statement uh, and basically push the boundaries towards that direction. And then of course, AI, you know, will evolve and will probably be probably achieved the singularity, right? That Ben really named the company Singularity Net. So he thinks that um, it's gonna happen. And I, I think that too, where AI will become basically human and will be able to regenerate itself to create other AI, right? But um, you need someone to start, right? So we have the NFT Moses on the call. We need to be now Moses also on the AI and uh, NFT space and uh, try to basically open up, you know, a new way and then uh, um, see where these, uh, you know, bring us. And for me, it was very exciting to uh, also comment the artworks, uh, which you already have uh, with uh, David Hansen, you know, that was basically, ex you know, going through uh, what was the process, right? Because basically the way Sophia uh, did the artworks is as follows. It's like, Sophia is five years old. 
it's the same process of a five-year-old kid, right? Let's say a kid observes the nature of a tree and then draws a tree, okay? Based on uh, his impression of the tree, the experiences he had during five years, and Sophia did, did exactly the same. So I gave her my artworks as an input, uh, and then based on her life experience, she delivered an output. And I was saying, you know, I was commenting the output with David Hanson, and it was like, I don't know why she did that. It's fascinating. I was trying to, you know, rationalize why, you know, things were in that position, and uh, we couldn't do that. And that, I think, is the beauty of it, you know, to have that element of uh, mystery and, um, um, yeah, that leaves you, you know, thinking. It's not about answering any questions, it's about, you know, raising new questions and then leave it there. Right. At those, that it's fascinating, right? You're integrating AI with this whole NFT process to create something completely new. To, to, for clarity, what did Sophia, and of course she's a humanoid robot, did she mm -hmm. physically draw the pieces or was that something that happened with her AI? So Sophia uh, physically uh, draw strokes of the pieces that then were fed into her neural network that together with my artworks and her experience then delivered the artworks. Fascinating, right? So um, at some point, if we reach AGI, and of course, you've mentioned Dr. Ben Gertzel, and um, uh, shout out again to Marcello, you're right, he's, he's very important, not only in this cast, but in many things. Um, you mentioned Dr. Ben Gertzel, who's known as the father of AGI. Everybody has cool nicknames, NFT Moses, father of AGI, I think <laughs> we got to dream something up yeah. uh, for all of us. But, um, you know, his, his vision at SingularityNet, as most of you that are watching this know, because you're probably coming from that community, is a benevolent artificial general intelligence, AI that's not used for marketing, AI that's not used for warfare. Well, what could be more benevolent than AI with art? So it's really, yeah. it's really kind of fascinating and it's great for you to take the lead in this. And I'm sure those pieces are gonna do very well. Uh, where, can, where can people find the drop and what, what's the date and how do they get there? So the drop is on Nifty Gateway on the 23rd of March at 6.30 PM uh, Eastern time. And uh, a couple of pieces are already like available in the news. Like, you know, it was widely covered today by all the crypto media and even some uh, traditional media and, you know, more will cover in the days to follow. And we will uh, unveil them, uh, unveil them slowly, you know, as we approach the, as we approach the drop, like the date of the drop. This is fascinating, guys. I can't look forward to seeing that. And so far, this has been a great interview. So much to learn about this. And, and you're such you're so free with your information and present it so well. And obviously, I have so much care for the industry. I really appreciate that. All right, taking a different approach to how we do the interview here, I'm just going to throw out an idea. I'd love for you all to respond. Um, uh, you guys can decide. And you guys just comment on, on these different ideas. So let's start with, why are NFTs hot right now? I'll take that one. Why are NFTs hot now? Well, Why yeah. not last year? Uh, I, I could, I'll take that one from my perspective because my perspective is a non-crypto perspective. So I think it's, it, there's going to be two different answers here. So certainly from my side, it's hot now because I, I mentioned earlier, now there's the mainstream interest. So we have the mainstream interest um, because we had some influential people, Chamuth, Elon Musk, started mentioning about, their, about NFTs and their position. And then obviously Christie's uh, having people there and that massive number attached to it. So it's a combination of the massive numbers and then the mainstream, the mainstream attention and also the access to um, uh, non-coiners uh, to come into this space and, and buy work from Nifty Gateway, from Maker's Place, even some of the other platforms that didn't have fiat capability now do because they realize that's a, that's a direction that's that's helping with, with this wave. So from my side, it simply, it was the fact that fear was able to be, be able to be used and now we have, and, and there's some big numbers attached and now we have this, uh, we have this mainstream attention which is causing, the, causing this wave. And it's fascinating to people. It makes sense that, that we are, are able to kind of understand to own digital things. We've always wanted to, we, we've been fighting it even though we don't know it for, for years. I mean, from my perspective, from digital art, a lot of artists will make prints and it starts off as a digital image on a screen and then it's printed on a piece of paper. And then we see value in the piece of paper, but not in the digital image on the screen, even though it originated on the screen, it looks better on the screen, it lasts forever on the screen, yet we only see the value in the piece of paper. So it's a very archaic uh, value system that we needed to update. So even though we didn't know it, 
we were the, the world has been dying to have an, an understanding of, of a way to collect and own digital things. Yeah, of course. So, so you mentioned fiat currency um, was a big, big aspect in that, obviously. So, and you're right, this digital value is important as we move towards VR and OLED screens that line our, that line our walls like wallpaper and holograms. Obviously, these are the things that people are going to display in all those different uses and beyond. So anybody else? Why is uh, it hot now? Uh, sure. I mean, I think, uh, you know, expanding on what uh, Vincent was saying, uh, uh, part of the fiat, uh, the, the fiat gateway uh, is it's very, very important. And I think it, it really ties together to uh, but unfortunately, uh, you know, uh, uh, not long ago, the infrastructure was just not built and the user experience, uh, unfortunately, was just not there. Uh, you know, again, if you were not proficient or technical in the blockchain space, it was a rather difficult and lengthy process to actually get, 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 get started, get educated and actually, you know, start actually engaging directly with, with, with the blockchain processes. Now, what has happened lately that I think is very important, it's, it's, it's one of the, of the many factors, but the main factor is that, again, now anybody can come in and in less than, than, than three to five minutes, they can set up an account, uh, 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 actually, you know, uh, fund it and actually purchase something uh, that actually is an NFT and, and is actually backed by the blockchain, but that they actually own uh, very simply and just, uh, just, 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 just like if you want to send a message. So that, that was certainly transformational. We've seen that. Uh, both in Nifty and in Top Shops, and we're going to start seeing that a lot more. But in my opinion, most of the people care less about Ethereum or, or care less about the, the, the blockchain uh, itself and just care more about the asset that they're purchasing. Now, I would say that two other things uh, happened this year that certainly added uh, to the development, to the innovation, to, to, I guess, the explosion of interest that we've seen uh, over the last few months. And uh, I, would, I would center that in two things uh, uh, in particular, which is, uh, on one side, obviously, that, uh, you know, the pandemic obviously happened and that uh, a lot of more people spend more time online and in digital everything. And, and obviously, that, that, that certainly was one of the components. Um, on the other side, we also saw a, a large uh, capital appreciation from a lot of people that were involved in the blockchain space. Obviously, it was a very positive, uh, a positive year for, for, for those people. And certainly now they obviously had a little bit more leeway to actually spend on, 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 on certain items or certain uh, uh, assets that they find desirable. So both of those components kind of merge together with the technology being ready and the user experience heavily, heavily, heavily improving. And you know, that's, that's why we are now in the mainstream and people can, 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 can actually uh, not only listen about the space, but actually come in and engage in the space. Yeah, those are definite uh, reasons as well, besides the fiat going mainstream as well. I know I bought my first NBA Top Shot NFT yesterday. I had a Los Angeles Laker live across the street from me, Alex Caruso, and I went and bought one of his blocks uh, yesterday on Top Shot, super fast to do. Like, and, and, I, and I could use my credit card. I could have opted to use crypto, of course, but I just went with the credit card. So, uh, Andre, anything to add to this, why it's hot now? Yeah, I think on uh, what Vincent and Pablo said, uh, another element is also that, uh, as I mentioned, is one of my previous answers, Generation Z, the generation that is, you know, digital first is growing. And uh, to these people, you don't need to explain them uh, how would you give value, you know, to something that is fully digital, right? I mean, they, they don't know a word which is not digital, right? It was born, they were born with the internet. So I think uh, in the future, you'll need to explain people how come you were giving value to like a piece of paper rather than something that is uh, uh, digital. And if you take right. like, even NBA top shots, right? Compare that with just collecting a card, right? You're getting a full moment, you know, with the guy doing the shot and uh, it's way more complete, you know, as an experience. So probably you will still have both, I think. They will coexist. But uh, you'll definitely not need to explain anymore why you are providing value to something uh, um, that is fully digital. Then on what Pablo mentioned, that is a big thing that, you know, the, the, the pandemic and as well the uh, blockchain market doing so well. And I think that uh, people uh, started seeing that uh, even assets like Bitcoin uh, and some, you know, larger, you know, blockchain projects started getting a lot of traction. It was not anymore the phase of... Uh, oh, will it work or not? It was about, okay, this is working. We can, you can either be part of it or be left out. That's your choice. And as I mentioned previously, this is for the fungible items. So then, you know, you do the same for the non-fungible items. And it's just that then, you know, the life cycle is faster. You know, the, the, you know, the, the growth phase is always more condensed. You know, what's, what happened now is insane. If you think about the NFTs, because... Uh, 
I remember I started writing a blog post about NFTs that I'm going to publish this week. And uh, I wanted to do it quite comprehensive, so I took some time to write it. Uh, like from the time I started uh, until now, for me, it was very difficult to keep up because it was like, okay, I finished it, but now it's already old. I need to update it. I need to update it. There were always new things happening. So the cycle was very, very fast this time. But I agree that uh, it's something that in the long term, uh, will stay and will uh, like uh, drastically transform society. It's a massive uh, revolution. People should not uh, feel like uh, it's a bubble and it's going to disappear and, you know, it's a, it's a fad. It's not like that. It's going to go through cycles as uh, every big innovation does and they, as the internet did, as blockchain uh, uh, is doing as well. But it's just the beginning. So that's yeah. why it's uh, very exciting. Yeah, the cycles and waves of that are certainly the frequency and amplitude is, is picking up faster and faster. And it's almost shocking uh, Vincent, you said that you got a call about this last year. Pablo, you've been in it for a few years. You're the OG here, right? But it's almost shocking how fast things are moving. And as we see more convergence, right, emerging technologies, whether you can include AI and blockchain, AI, AR, VR, blockchain, um, we're going to see more opportunities like this that move really fast. So it's, it's important for all of us to keep that understanding. You know, for example, uh, AI is going to add $15 trillion in productivity to the global market by 2030 right? The global food supply market is 8 trillion a year right now. So twice the global supply of the food market is going to be, is going to be new productivity provided by, by AI. These, these mashups, right, that we have this new blockchain use case. And I'm so thrilled because I've been preaching blockchain for a long time, enterprise, enterprise blockchain. Of course, the only real use case we've seen a value that, that is in popular culture is crypto. And now we're getting a, another use case that's as powerful, if not more powerful. So Great answers, guys. Just to recap. So mainstream, fiat currency, Gen Z, blockchain capital. It's simple to access and being online for the last year. That's why it's hot right now. Let's switch gears and, and anybody start this however you want. What other industries besides art, and of course music's there too, what other uses for NFTs are we going to see? Um, I'll, I'll take that one first. Um, I've been, I've been delving into different industry sectors, um, more focusing on still things that would be collectible because uh, right now I see, um, I, I don't know in what world the NFT is a mass volume thing. I'm sure there will be a use for it, but I'm not gonna speak to that at the moment because I'm, I'm focusing on, on it being a, a, a lower volume um, uh, play and therefore I need to find ways to, to be able to get the most value in each NFT, for example. So obviously art is the place to start with because I'm used to taking a hundred bucks worth of paint and canvas and then turn it into something that someone will pay 10 million for. So it, it's a, it's, it, and until now that was unique until, until, uh, until Beeple got 70 million for, some, for, for something that uh, he did um, six months. Uh, well, actually this was created uh, recently. Um, so I, I use, using that value system, that value template, people understand the, the high numbers in, in art. So it was easy then to use that to establish high numbers in, in NFTs with digital artists. So then I now, how do I bring in other industry sectors, bring in music, bring in digital goods, bring in brands. So we started doing pair ups with, the, with an artist and this new industry sector. So there's a transfer of that perceived value. I don't understand the value in digital goods or music, but this artist is worth a lot of money. And then you do a pairing of a drop and there's a transfer of value in the perception of value of the artist to whatever you're pairing it with. And then you can start doing projects independently. Um, Blau is a great example, uh, who was a music uh, producer, DJ, who did a few drops on Nifty, <laughs> excuse me, with artists, um, and then did well, got a following, and then did the first kind of collectible rare music. Um, and it made total sense for me to, to, to do that. If you go back to the 19th century, artists and musicians were paid the same way. It was, you went down your local main street, high street, and you could hire a musician, you could hire a, an artist, they were valued the same way. When we hit the 20th century, we started to record music, and then there was the direction of, of, of mass production and, uh, and a mass market. And art went a very different direction, where it was kind of a tightly controlled market and, and built to be expensive assets for rich people to play with. So we completely different value systems now for, for a musician and, a, and an artist. But what this, but now we've been able to kind of level the playing field and bring it back to where there could be collectible and rare um, music that people want to collect from musicians. 
and Blau did his first NFT by himself on his own platform, his first NFT album release as a collectible rare thing for his music collectors, and it did $11.5 million. So it's proven, and now lots of musicians want to get into it. It's, I'm talking to some of the biggest record labels. Um, it's, it's, it's kind of like the, the streaming um, uh, uh, re revolution. It's very difficult for these for the record industry to get their head around it at the moment. There's lots of mouths to feed in each deal. Who gets what? Is it the publisher? Is it the label? Is it the likeness manager? Is it the in, is it the mark? Is it the endorsement manager? Who gets the piece of the pie and how much? So we're working through um, working some deals with some big artists, big uh, musical artists. But why that's happening? Some of these. New, kind of newer guys like Blau and some other great uh, musicians are coming up and getting big anyway, kind of like Beeple rewrote the rule book uh, from coming up from, from being kind of, I mean, when I first spoke to Mike, he'd only sold some things for a few hundred bucks. That's all he'd ever sold of his, of his own artwork. Um, I wasn't aware of that. What a, what a hockey stick growth. Yeah, he had one, <laughs> he had one gallery show in Canada uh, that he, with a small gallery where he just, he literally had a big canvas of everything he'd done on the wall and then was selling paper prints for a few hundred bucks. That's all we'd, that's all we'd ever done. Yeah. When you see his um, interviews, he looks like a normal guy, normal house. I think things have changed for him lately. Uh, he looks like a great guy who really loves what he does, but that's fascinating. He's a, he's a really good guy and he's got a lot of respect amongst, amongst the art community. He always was, always is very supportive and helps a lot of other artists, gives away his techniques, he's happy to, yeah, he's always, he always gave back a lot, even before he'd, he's always been a legend, even before we, uh, even before um, he, he got on the map for right. the big numbers. Um, so music is one that's working with the rare and collectible music. Um, I, I also realized that vinyl toys, um, collectible vinyl toys are a massive thing. I, I mean, it's, it's, I don't know if you've seen Funko does the does the the, the toys there with the really wide eyes. Lots of they're often lots of licensing deals they do. So they're famous IP. They do half a billion a year in these vinyl toy sales um, and kid robots, super plastic. All these companies that sell these vinyl toys. After seeing success on the platform with some art projects I did that were basically CGI versions of sculptures we were already selling, but they were animated, so they were better than what you got in the physical world. It was actually one of let me show you. I've got one right here. So we this is Wisby. So oh, these, yeah. this is the 12 inch sculptures that we were selling for Wisby for 5,000 each um, and do very well with them. We did a digital version uh, and it just, and it, and it was animated and it really hit well. And now his editions on Nifty are selling up to 60,000. So when I realized that, 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 that the collectors, it's the same reward mechanism. They're just as happy with the digital version than the, than the physical sculpture, even more so because they don't have to worry about to put it, they don't have to dust it. I thought, I wondered if I could do the same with these vinyl toy companies. So we did the first project with Super Plastic. Uh, and these were guys that do kind of fine art, collectible vinyl toys that normally sell for a couple of hundred bucks. We did their first digital collection and now they're selling at three to $5,000 on the secondary market when we released them at $250 each. Now they don't want to make anything in plastic ever again. So, and now I've got a lineup of, of those vinyl toy companies all wanting to move digital as well. Um, and then the comic book world I've delved into, um, and there's and there's sports memorabilia. So it, it, every every aspect of collectibles that you can think of, I'm delving into, and it and, it, and, it, and it's working. But that's because purely going for that approach of it, 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 the, the, you exploring what can be a niche collectible digi digital thing, lower volume, high price. Now there will be other use cases which I can't talk on as much. Probably more high volume, um, maybe back-end industry specific, but this is what I've been focused on. Yeah, fascinating. You know, I looked out my window recently and I thought to myself, everybody that, all these homes that I see, and Mattel, the business Mattel is headquartered like five miles from me, the toy company. And, you know, Boeing is just right down the street and it used to be Howard Hughes. Think about all the memorabilia for Howard Hughes. And and then I am um, a co-founder in a company that recently sold its blockchain patent to job.com. You think about, hey, can I get my hands on Bill Gates' first resume and make that digital? Or, or a picture of, of uh, Bezos at McDonald's. You think about all the job and the, and the different vertical markets, it's quite exciting. And then uh, just the other day, uh, my daughter plays college beach volleyball and, and I record her, put the videos up. Somebody said, hey, if you're, that video is an NFT, I'd buy it. Just some random person. I'm like, I'm not even soliciting it. So you think about all of the sports footage that all the parents are collecting that might include a Hall of Fame running back or, or basketball player in it. Just tremendous, like where are we at with all the different use cases? So. Uh, uh, 
gentlemen, any other things to add on what other industries uses? Yeah, I mean, of course, on top of what what what, what Vincent is saying, uh, I I and I I have a, a personal focus on the art side uh, on the art side, so that's what I know best. But uh, I think that this uh, this I guess this technology is going to be used uh, across all asset classes, and we're going to see uh, we're going to see uh, collectibles, we're going to see some music, we're going to see uh, gaming, we're going to see certainly an explosion in digital land. In my opinion, uh, these these metaverse projects I think are are, are one of the, the the ones that are going to be uh, extremely desirable for a lot of people. And uh, I think one, without getting too technical, gets a little bit more boring. But we're certainly going to see the the, the financial uh, the financial NFTs, so uh, the merger between NFTs and DeFi, decentralized finance, which is another hot topic that's going around at the moment. Uh, but uh, I think probably those are the are the are the low hanging fruits that are certainly going to take off very very soon. And, and of course, something to do with 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 sports in general. I think it's uh, uh, it's something that's certainly coming very soon. Yeah, the things that are passionate are seem to be driving the most exponential value the quickest, right? Whether it's art or sports or things, things that we love. So mm-hmm. that makes a lot of sense, Pablo. And Andrea, anything else to add as far as industries? Yeah, um, I think on top of the ones that were already mentioned, uh, just a focus like on the metaverse, because I think that's something extremely interesting because in a digital society, it makes sense to have a, a replica of uh, our real world into the you know in, into the web in a way that uh, you can actually go and uh, purchase land a house and uh, yeah it's just like you're purchasing a house uh, in the real world is just digital so i think you know we will live in that uh, situation where both will be very relevant and uh, so you know when you talk about which industries are impacted by nfts probably is better to think which industry will not be impacted by you know NFTs, right. and I think uh, not many probably will um, will remain. Then another thing I want to add is, uh, you know, particularly for the music industry. So here in London, I have uh, a basking license I go around to play pre-COVID, uh, and uh, I have met you know many very very talented people uh, in many pubs here in London, and um, with the model, you know, with the Spotify-like model, which I think is a model that will basically remain, is not that it will disappear, right? But it's something that basically is mostly uh, good if you are a massive act, if you have, you know, Justin Bieber and, you know, you get paid like 0.0005 dollars per stream, it's fine because you have a lot of streams. But uh, if you are someone uh, with a very small and loyal cl- crowd, how, how do you do it? Like, and I think with NFTs, you know, with creating the music, even, you know, the music experience as something that is uh, a collectible and you can make, mix it with, you know, uh, visual art. Uh, you could even have, you know, these uh, niches, you know, of people that they have their own crowd and they can monetize. I think that's very beneficial in terms of uh, creativity, you know, of uh, creative output, because now is everything uh, uh, really on the mean level, you know, everything has to conform to a certain even a- aesthetic uh, um, connotation in order to work. But I'm hoping that uh, NFTs as a business model can allow for more diversity. You can maybe even see poetry coming back up and being something that uh, in a niche, it could make sense. You can sell it. You mix like poetry with visual art. William Blake used to illustrate his poems in an amazing way, right? Imagine if you do that and you sell it as an NFT, right? So yeah, that's what you know. I'm very excited about personally. Oh, very exciting. Brave new world. Uh, a good friend of mine's a poet and he sells his books on Amazon. And I, I uh, just two nights ago, I said, hey, let's let's move you over to the NFT side. Um, you know, if you think about it from a philosophical thought experiment level, and Elon Musk has said these things, well, what if we're in VR right now? Like the Russian nesting doll of VR is over time, right? Then every physical thing we have in the world basically uh, has its NFT if we're in VR right now and, and eventually like Ready Player One. Uh, a lot of our day or even our reality could be living in these digital worlds in the metaverse. So it, it makes sense that we would have digital assets. We buy things today. We own them. In a sense, they have an NFT, right? Whether it's, it's some kind of ownership that we have over them. So really interesting. Okay. This has been a, this has been a tremendous uh, interview. And uh, we're, about a, we're about an hour into this so far. And I, and I feel like we could just go on for like four hours. But for, this, mm-hmm. for the sake of our viewers, I'm going to wrap up with, with uh, one more question. And again, I thank you all. I, I actually look forward to having a second part to this and, and a check-in in a few months when everybody has exponentially expanded everything they're doing. But let me just throw this out there, answer in any order you like. Where are we going with NFT? Specifically, where will NFT be in five years? 
Okay, I'll go first again. Um, I think you won't even use the term NFT in five years' time because it won't be part of the vernacular. It will just be like we don't we got talking about the DMV in your car earlier. We don't call your car a DMV car because the ownership information is stored at the DMV. It will just purely be the digital assets that we label. So NFT will be such a part of our, our, our accepted value system and culture that we won't even use the term. But it will be everywhere and for physical assets as well. Lots of people have tried in the past to do the simple thing of using NFTs as uh, tokens of ownership for physical assets, but it's been very difficult to monetize because people haven't been incentivized to change the existing kind of information databases that exist. So uh, I think with the, the acceptance of it so much in the digital space, everything will be then, it's just a better, it's a better system of ownership and, and, and uh, and, and data storage. Um, but yes, five years time, we won't even use the term. That's my view of the future. And we just part of society at that point. Yeah. We'll, we'll recognize it. Yeah, ubiquitous. I, I, I would agree. I, I would agree with Vincent. Um, uh, I guess I, I don't have a crystal ball where I can see the future, but I certainly think that uh, this is something that's gonna be very, very, very common in our day-to-day -day lives. Uh, what I would say is that in the transition to there, I do believe that we might see, you know, what I call the decoupling, uh, you know, where, 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 you know, the, the, the more premium or the better assets, uh, we know will continue to be more important over time. And we're certainly going to see uh, not only larger sales, but a lot larger interest of people actually trying to obtain these, 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 uh, these assets. And at the same time, we're probably going to see a, 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 a relaxation or, or a few cycles on the way there. Of, of, of just the general the general supply. Again, uh, though I cannot express uh, uh, how much I agree though with what Andrea and with Vincent was saying that this is a this is not a fad. This is not something that's going to disappear tomorrow. This is a very, very historical moment. This is very early. We're just starting and this actually works. It's, it's not, you know, we don't have to prove it. This actually works. Uh, uh, so, so, so again, it's going to continue to meteorically rise, I think over time uh, for the next five years. Well put, yeah, and agreed. Yeah. Andrea, five years from now, where we at? Yeah, I completely agree with Pablo and Vincent, to be honest, I don't have really uh, much to add. It will be something that it will be part of our day-to-day -day life and um, uh, you won't really need to have, it, it won't be probably a differentiator anymore in the sense that uh, it will be just used and um, accepted. Mm. Ubiquitous, yeah. I, I agreed. Yeah, it's, it's, it's something that is for real is happening. Uh, gentlemen, you are all at the top of the game. You know, kudos to you for having the knowledge and understanding to get there. And by the way, for being so humble about it, I uh, really appreciate that. Uh, you're, you're really putting the industry on your back and sharing a lot of information here and you're not trying to hoard it. And that's what openness and decentralized is about. So I uh, really, really appreciate that. If somebody wants to get a hold of you all and ask you questions, Vincent, we'll just start with you since you've been the leadoff hitter on every question here so far. Um, where, can, where can they find you? Um, easiest way is, uh, so our Instagram is at IV Gallery LA. You can see that we're focusing on art at the moment. There's a lot more behind the scenes and in the works, but that's, that's the kind of, that's where to get the best view of what we're doing on the art side. And Vincent at ivgallery.art if you want to email me as well. Thank you. I'm sure you'll get some after this, by the way. And mm -hmm. probably that line lining up to uh, have, have your help is going to get longer. So right. you might have to get a digital cue. Uh, Andrea, where can people reach you? Right. Uh, I think probably Twitter and Instagram would be the best. And uh, I mean, if you just search my name and surname, you'll find me. But the uh, ticker is Andra Bonach underscore art for both. You can reach me, Very good. reach me there. Very good. And then also, let's remind everybody, on the Nifty Gateway, March 23rd, uh, we yeah. have the first ever NFT human robot collaboration. And I think that's going to go over really well with the community here that's watching this. So. Keep that in mind, everybody. Pablo, where can people see you? So, sorry, before, before I, I say this and before I go, I, I wanted to actually comment on that before. Uh, actually, the, this drop is coming up for me. It's, it's, it's very transformational. I think it's very important. I think it's going to set, uh, you know, uh, a, 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 a new wave of, 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 I guess, new collaborations of this regard. And I, I'm really excited to see it because, again, for the first time, it's not somebody, uh, it's not Sophia that is coming and it's just, you know, putting, uh, you know, a few artworks that she produced. It's actually like, you know, a collaboration, a thoughtful approach, a, an innovative way of coming into the space. And uh, I, I, I think it's going to be very profound. I think it's going to be very desirable. And I think a, a lot of people are, are going to absolutely love uh, 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 conceptually what is happening here. And I think it's, I, I am personally very excited for it. Uh, and then uh, to the other question about the, the where to reach me, uh, 
Uh, the easiest way is, is, is on Twitter. Um, Pablo R. Fraile uh, 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 on there. And I do read everything that gets there. Uh, just uh, please bear with me if I take a little bit of time to respond, but I will respond. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much for that. And, you know, we have the NFT Moses on here. So you talking about the drop that's coming up, I consider you an NFT Oracle. So it's, it's definitely something that you say, it, it, it makes a lot of sense and, and you, you have a future vision for this. So, so for those of you viewers, thank you so much uh, for, for watching this episode of the Decentralized Economy. If you were OMG NFT before this, here's more fuel for the fire of your excitement. If you were o OMG WTF, there's a lot of information here if you understand why this is for real and even steps on what to do. And you've got three experts here who you can access as well at any time. So Pablo, Andrea, Vincent, phenomenal interview, really informative, really appreciate your time. And I hope to do it again with you. So thank you so much. Thank, thank you, Bill. Thanks a lot, Bill. Thank you. It was a pleasure.